Hello everyone and welcome to the One Stop Co-op Shop. This is Colin and today we are going to do something very special. We're going to play The War of the Ring. Now this game is normally a competitive game and I'm going to play it as if I'm playing both the Shadow Player and the Free Peoples. Yes, yeah, so this means I'm going back to when you used to only play solo games, having to play both sides on your own. <laughs> uh, but I thought it'd be a great way to show you guys how this game works. And then I'll do another playthrough in about a month from now, doing one of the uh, fan-made solo co-op uh, scenarios. But those only use the base game. And since I have here the collector's edition with everything, I thought I'd like to do one that way. And I think this will be the best way to show that. So I do want to call out, though, that although I have the collector's edition here, I am using the cards from the second edition. I'm using the rules from the second edition. So anyone that has the second edition, you'll be able to follow this along no problem. So I am going to be playing with both the Lords of Middle-Earth and the Warriors of Middle-Earth expansions. So this game is not going to be short. So make sure to grab yourself a cup of coffee and uh, we can jump into this. If you want to see a base game playthrough, I learned by Ricky watching Ricky Royal and uh, Paul Darcy. So I'll link both of those in the description below. But both of those are only the base game. This is going to include the expansions as well. And I think with that, let's go ahead and jump in to set up. On page 16 of the rulebook, it'll state where all starting troops will be placed out on the board. You have a total of four different Free Peoples nations and three different Shadow uh, nations. Also for the Free Peoples, you'll want to grab the Fellowship marker, which here it's Frodo and Sam. Frodo and Sam can never be separated and they start off here in Rivendell. We have over here the Fellowship track. I have grabbed the Fellowship token as well as the Corruption token here, both placing them at zero. One of the ways the shadow player will be able to win is if ever they can get corruption, this token all the way up to the 12 on the fellowship track. You'll also want to ensure that the fellowship token has the hidden side uh, on top, not the revealed side. So I'll have the hidden side face up for now. Next, let's set up our companions to Frodo and Sam. So there's a total of seven of these because if you think of Sam and Frodo would be eight and nine. So that makes your nine of the fellowship. Now in the base game, they have nine or seven of these. And then the Lord's uh, expansion adds seven new ones, seven new cards with the same characters. You can swap any of these out if you would like. And I'm going to swap out the Gandalf for this Gandalf because this Gandalf will let me play with one additional die at the beginning of the game. And I'll show you how that works during the playthrough. I'm going to take these and put them back in the box. I will not use them for this, uh, this specific game. Now, if I was playing against an actual player, that player would not know if I had swapped any of the other ones out because only, they only need to see who the guide is. And the guide always starts off as Gandalf. Also, with the Lord's expansion, you can have some of your companions actually start off on the board in their re uh, designated locations, like their homelands. I'm not going to do that either. I'm going to keep all of them in the fellowship. If you did do that, the shadow player would get some of these tokens that would allow them to do certain abilities during the game. Uh, yeah, so I'm not even going to, I'm not going to play with that. <laughs> This board is so gosh darn huge. Sorry about that. <laughs> Way up here, we have our fellowship. And you can see I have Gandalf the guide on top. We also have all of our miniatures for each of our players besides Sam and Frodo. Sam and Frodo are actually out on the board in Rivendell. And then each one of these characters has a token with their picture on it. We're going to have all of those here because sometimes you might have to lose or randomly choose one of your companions. And that's how you'll do that. We'll place the rest of these cards on the side of the table. We have Elrond, we have Galadriel, Aragorn, we have Gollum, we have Treebeard, Gandalf the White, and Smeagol. Just set them aside. They may come into play during the game, and you'll see how that works through the playthrough. Next, we're going to set up our three elven rings. We have Vilya over here that's controlled by Elrond. We have uh, here Nenya, which is controlled by Galadriel, and we have Narya over here by Gandalf. Now, if you're playing with the base game, you'll just have the basic rings, but here we have upgraded ones because we can use them in two different ways now. One, you can use one of those to change any of your action dice to any other side of the die itself, except for the wild side, which is the uh, Will of the West. But now they all have an additional ability as well if those companions are out on the board. So for example, Vilya, if we have uh, Elrond on the board, we can use that to keep an action die that we just used, except for a Will of the West, and not discard it after use. So we could essentially use it a second time. Pretty cool. Next, we're going to set up our event cards. When you're playing with the Warriors of Middle-Earth expansion, you're going to have a third deck here. So we have a character deck, we have a strategy deck, and we have a faction deck. Each turn, you're going to draw one card from each of these. 
These two will set one hand worth of six cards. If you have more than six cards of these two types, you're not going to be able to, well, you draw more and you have to discard some. If you have faction cards, you can have a total of four faction cards in hand as well. You'll want to simply shuffle these up, and if you're playing with the expansions, make sure to look to see which cards you need to pull out of these decks and add to them. There are certain ones like the Balrog you need to pull out, uh, the Corsair, Corsair ships, because of course you can actually play those on the board with the expansions. So make sure to look at the rule book. It's on the first page talking about uh, removing those cards. Up at the top of the board, we also have the same thing for the Free Peoples, our character deck, our strategy deck, and our faction deck. Just like the free people, the shadow player also has minions here. They have minor or lesser minions and regular minions. You want to grab all of those cards and set them aside. And each one has specific things that have to happen in the game for you in order to actually bring them on the board. You're going to see we have minis for each one of them. I love that they're all painted. They look so awesome. <laughs> uh, so, you know, people like Saruman. Uh, we've also got the Black Witch King. We even have the Belrog. <laughs> uh, so we could potentially put those out on the board. So keep all these to the side and be ready to use them. There are a total of six factions in the game. Three for the free people and three for the shadow player. Each one has two call to battle cards. You're going to set these aside, and if ever you're in combat and you can use one of those factions because they're out on the board, you can put those cards directly into your hand and you can play them during the play card or event card phase of combat. And you'll see how that works during the playthrough. Just make sure to set these aside. Do not shuffle them into the decks. Uh, the first time I played, I thought that's what I had to do. No. <laughs> you want to take these, set them aside, and then you'll pull them and play them during combat if they can affect combat. The three shadow factions you'll have are the Corsairs, the Brood, and the Hillman of Dunland. You'll grab these cards up here into notes how they can be uh, put into play, and then you'll flip them over and they have all their special effects and all of that. On the free people side, we have the Eagles, we have the Dead Men of Dunharrow, and the Ents of Fanghorn. Yeah, th this is just going to be so insane and fun. <laughs> I hope you guys are excited. I will say that if I make any terrible uh, strategy decisions, I apologize. Trying to control everything and record, I'm sure I'm not going to make the best decision. But at least I'll help you guys see how the game plays and we can create our own story. That's what I will say. When even when playing this solo, the emergent story you get from it is phenomenal. Next, let's go ahead and set up the hunt tiles. So there are a total of 24 of these beige tiles. These are the standard ones. I'm going to put them into this cup. And whenever we have to draw for hunt damage, we're going to draw these tokens. Also, because I'm playing with the Lords of Middle-Earth expansion, I have two Smeagol tokens I'm also going to put in there. You won't do that if you're playing the base game. You also have these red ones and blue ones. These two are special hunt tiles, and they will only go into the cup, since I'm playing with a cup, when we have the Fellowship at uh, actual Mordor. So right now, we're just going to set these aside, but we may be able to put them into our, uh, into our hunt tiles later. Next, we'll need to grab our action dice. Now, I am playing with the second edition dice, not the collector's edition dice, so you, when you pull out your copy, you can match your dice to what I'm using. The Shadow Player, given that they have more units, they are more powerful in pretty much every way, will start off with seven action dice to begin with. The uh, Free Peoples will only start with four. However, you can see I have this one extra die here, and that's because I have Gandalf the Grey, the Keeper of Narya. So this says, uh, because we have him as the guide, if Gandalf the Grey is the guide during the recovery action dice phase, and you recovered at least one Free Peoples action die from the hunt box, add the Narya die uh, to the action pool. Now you'd think, well, we're not at the recovery phase yet, Colin. Well, the exception is if you start the game with him as the guide, you get to start with the Narya die. So we'll actually have five for the Free People, seven for the Shadow Player. If Galadriel or Elrond come into play, we can also earn these two dice to have them come into play as well. Conversely, on the Shadow Player side, we have the Balrog die, so if the Balrog comes into play, and we have the Gothmog die. So if Gothmog comes into play, we will also have this Lesser Minion die as well. So you can see we can get lots more actions that way, not to mention we each have a Faction die. So if ever we get a Faction onto the board, we'll be rolling these Faction dice. But for now, none of these are in play. It's just these seven and these five. Let's go ahead now and set up the political track here. We have Sauron one step away from at war and active. We have Saruman also one step away from at war and active. And we have the Easterlings two steps away from at war and active. 
The Gondorians are inactive, so you can see the active will be this side, inactive is this side, and they are two steps away from at war. And then unfortunately, the Rohirrim, <laughs> they're inactive and three steps away. The Elves are active, but they're also three steps away from at war. And then the uh, the Northern, the Northernlings and the Dwarves are both here as well, inactive and three steps away from at war. Why it matters if you're at war or not is you cannot muster more units onto the board or move into even friendly or unfriendly lands until you're at the at war step. And you can't move into the at war step until you're active. So you first have to make sure you're active and make sure you're all the way down at the bottom of this track. So that is one of the biggest challenges the free people have in order to defend themselves against the, uh, the, the shadow player. Finally, we have our victory point tracker here. So I've already talked about how the shadow player can corrupt the ring bearer all the way to 12 to win the game. The other way they can win is through militarily getting all the way to 10 here. The uh, free peoples can actually win a military victory if they can get four victory points or if they can dunk the ring into Mount Doom. So we've already set up the armies on the board. However, we also have our reinforcements over here. The only thing I want you to know about the reinforcements here is whenever the shadow player loses a unit on the board, it's going to come back into the reinforcements here. For the free, free people's player, whenever they lose any of their units that are on the board, they are not going to come on here. Instead, they're going to go back into the box. They're gone forever. So you can see up here are all the free peoples. Yeah, they don't have a lot of army units. So getting that army victory of four victory points is going to be hard. That's why a lot of times you're just going to try and get that ring to Mordor as soon as possible. So there you have it. That is our setup. Let's jump into the playthrough and have a bit of fun. <laughs> May the best hand win. <laughs> I have no idea who's going to win. I'd be curious to know uh, what you guess who's going to win, either the free people or the, the shadow before watching, and then you can see if you're right. <laughs> War of the Ring plays in a total of six phases. We're going to start with our first phase called the Recovery Action Dice and Draw Event Cards. Now I've already showed you the dice we're going to grab for our first round. We're also going to draw cards for each player. So we have a character deck, a strategy deck, and the faction deck. We're going to draw one from each of these. So our faction deck, we have Evil Things. For our character card, we have the Captain of Despair, and it has a combat uh, ability that we can use it for as well. So if we're in combat, we can use this lower section. If we want to use one of our action dice, we can do the top part. And then our third one for our strategy is Half Orcs and Goblin Men. We'll also do the same for the Free Peoples. We have a character, a strategy, and a faction card. So we have a You Know the Way There, a Power to Great, and March the Ents. Phase two will be the fellowship phase. This is where the free people's player may declare the position of the fellowship. Why we'd want to do that is if we declare the position of the fellowship inside of a free people's stronghold that's controlled by the free peoples, first we can activate that nation, and then second of all, we can actually heal one corruption. So there's reasons why you would actually want to declare it. Right now, it's silly to declare it. Also do note when you do declare the fellowship, you're not going to reveal the fellowship. You'll keep them in the hidden state. You'll just reveal and update where the uh, specific miniatures are on the board. We also at this time can change who the guide is. However, I want to keep it as Gandalf for now, so we'll leave it as is. Our next phase is the hunt allocation. The shadow player may now place a number of action dice in the hunt box located on the game board over here. We have to place at least one here if the Fellowship had used one or more dice during the previous round for moving the Fellowship. That hasn't happened here, so technically I could put no dice here and focus purely on military. Moving units, recruiting units, pushing myself down on the political track. But I for sure want to put at least one die here, maybe two, and you'll see why. So what you do is, I have those seven action dice. I'm going to place one with an I symbol here. The max amount of dice that I can put here is equal to the maximum amount of companions with the Fellowship. And Sam and Frodo are considered not a companion. So right now there are seven companions. So I could technically put all seven dice here if I'd like as eyes. No, that's, I'm not going to do that. I think... Let's start this first round with just one, because I want to get my military moving on the shadow player side, so that way I'll roll six dice, I'll keep one here. Now let's move to phase four, the action roll. So each player will roll all their action dice. For our uh, free peoples, we have our four starting action dice, plus one because of Narya, thanks to the uh, Gandalf that we're using. So we'll roll these up, and you can see here, this is actually quite a good roll. We have two character dice, we have... Uh, a muster die, and we have two Will of the West, which can be wild. They can be anything. Wow. <laughs> that was not a bad roll at all. 
In my apologies, I called this a muster. This is a, definitely not a muster. That's an army die. A muster die looks uh, just like, well, let me show you. There we go. That is a muster symbol. Uh, this is the army symbol. Those are the five free people's dice. Let's do the seven for the shadow player. And the first thing you want to see is if any of these rolled an eye, because if you did, those ones would immediately have to go to the hunt for the ring. None of these are eye symbols. We got a couple event dice. We have a character die and we have two muster dice. We have no army dice. That's actually, wow, that's not what I was expecting. That's a pretty terrible role for the shadow player, to be honest. Now we're going to move to the bread and butter of the game, the action phase, phase five. This is where we will take turns, starting with the free peoples. You always start with the free peoples and rotating back and forth. You can choose to activate one die. Now, if ever you have less dice than the other player, you can choose to pass until you have the same amount of dice. So for an example, as the free peoples, I could pass this first turn. Then the shadow player uses this one. Now I can no longer pass because we have the same amount of action dice. So uh, with that, though, I think I'm going to use a character die. Now, what I'll do is I'll explain what you can do with these dice as we use them and uh, then tell you which thing I'm going to use them for. So how character dice work, we can use them either to move one army that has a leader, and I'll show you leaders in a bit, or we can actually have an army that can attack with a leader that's in it. We also can play an event card that has a character symbol on it. Uh, we could play those ones out on the table. For the free people, we can move the fellowship. That's why two sides of the dice actually have the character symbol because you're going to want to move that fellowship. I mean, if that's what your goal is, you could make your goal trying to get four victory points, which is totally plausible. Uh, it's just a little bit more of a challenge. So we're definitely going to be moving the fellowship. At least you want to at least bluff that <laughs> to the shadow player, if nothing else. You also can use character dice to separate companions from the fellowship. And you can separate as many companions as you want, but they all have to move into one group. So if I use this one and I separated three companions, those three companions need to go as a group. I can maybe use this one to separate, let's say, Gandalf, and this one to separate Aragorn. Um, so that's the difference. This one, I could separate Gandalf and Aragorn, but they have to go to the same space. This one, uh, if I did these two separately, this one, Gandalf could go uh, south, let's say, and this one, we could have Aragorn going east. And just like in the books, once the companions leave the fellowship, they can never return. So that's something that's important to note. The shadow player can also use their character dice to move their minions. Oh, and there's one other thing you can do with the character die for the free people. Let's say our fellowship has been revealed. We can use a character die to hide it again. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this uh, character die here and move the fellowship. We'll grab our fellowship token here and move ourselves to spot one. Now, whenever we move the fellowship, that is when the hunt matters. I'm going to place this die right here just outside of this box. After we resolve the hunt, I'm actually going to move this die into the box because that will matter if we decide to move the fellowship again. And when we recover dice, our shadow player is going to have to leave one die here because we moved the fellowship. So right now, though, it's outside of the box because what we do as the shadow players, we can hunt for that ring. Every time the fellowship moves, it makes them vulnerable, right? They're moving all of these different places. We can maybe find them on the road. Get those Nazgul out there. So dependent upon how many dice we've placed here, we're going to roll that many D6s. Since we only placed one die, we're only going to get to roll one D6. Now, I did upgrade my dice just like Ricky did. I got red dice for the shadow player and blue dice for the, uh, the free people. What we're going to try and do right now is roll a six. If we do, then we can do some hunt damage. We'll give the die a roll, and we rolled a one. No, <laughs> we're pretty terrible at trying to find the fellowship right now. If the last known place where the fellowship was had either a Nazgul, any shadow enemy units, or in an enemy stronghold, so let's say like Moria, we'd actually get re-rolls based on these. Uh, but we don't have any of those right now. Right now, the last known place for the fellowship is in Rivendell, which means they're safe. So no re-rolls, that's all we can do. Now I'll slide this character die into the hunt space here. And the next time we try and move the fellowship this round, we will have the shadow player still roll only one die, because there's still only one die here, but they get a success on fives or sixes. And if they place another one here, then it's four fives and sixes. So the more we move in a round, the more likely the uh, shadow player is going to be able to find us. Moving to our shadow player, I think the first die we're going to use is a muster die. We're going to push one of our factions all the way to at war. This means I'll take this die and move it off the table. Uh, I will get that back next round, but that way this shows the remaining actions that I can take. 
we're going to push the Isengardians down to at war. And why that matters is now we can cross any borders and we can start mustering units, which is what we want. I should also mention that you can use muster dice to play a muster event card from your hand. And then nations that are at war, you can either place one elite unit in any friendly and free settlement or two leaders in any two different friendly and free settlements or two regular units in any two friendly and free settlements or one leader and one regular army unit in two different friendly and free settlements. I'm sure you're going to see that as we play. Kind of sounds like a lot, but <laughs> it's pretty simple once you start playing. Finally, for the shadow player, you can also use that mustard die to bring some of your characters into play. And you'll see that as we play. So now we're going to move back to the fellowship. And we successfully moved to fel the fellowship one time. Let's try it again. But now, because we have one die already in the hunt pool area, our shadow player will succeed on a five or a six. This means that our fellowship could be up to two spaces away from Rivendell. Now, if ever we do decide to declare, declare where we are or we are found, we can find or reveal ourselves anywhere within zero to two of the spaces from where we are now. The only catch to that is if we are forced to be revealed because we are found, we cannot have where we end to be in a stronghold of the free people because obviously they probably found us on the road. They didn't find us in Rivendell. <laughs> Still only one die and no rerolls. And what do we get? Oh, we got a one. Wow, that's two ones in a row. This is not looking good for the shadow player. That does mean we'll place this die here into the hunt box. And now if we try and move again, they will succeed on a four, five, or six. Moving back to our shadow player, and I think what I'm going to do is use an event die. Now you can use this for two things. Either one, draw any event card that you'd like, or two, play any event card you'd like, even including the faction cards. The one that I think I'm going to play is called the Half Orcs and Goblin Men. Now remember, whenever you're playing this not in combat, you only will do the top action. If we are playing it during combat, we'd use the bottom action. I'm sure I'll show you that as we play. But for now, we're going to use this to go ahead and say, play if Isengard, Isengard is at war. It's definitely at war. Recruit one Isengard unit, regular or elite, in a region where a shadow army is present. Isengard units come in two different types. We've got the elites that are here, and we've got the regular units that are here. For our shadow player, our leaders are only the Nazgul. And then the characters themselves also have leadership. So unlike the free people, you'll see they actually have leadership characters for each of the different uh, types of free people. For our shadow player, these are only your leaders, the terrible Nazgul. <laughs> So the advantage of having an elite versus a regular unit is an elite takes two points of damage to kill. Your opponent needs to take get two successes to get rid of them. Uh, and that's really important because there is a stacking limit in each location. You can have a maximum of 10 units. So that means if you can have that with 10 elite units, that's essentially 20 units. Or if you have it as 10 regular units, well, then that means after 10 points of damage, they're gone. So I'm definitely, for right now, since I have an elite, I'm going to put an elite into uh, Isengard. We are definitely going to gear ourselves up to start attacking these Rohirrim as soon as we can. We don't want them to give them too much time to prepare uh, because they can be a bugger to get out of Helm's Deep. <laughs> so we want to take them out before they can do that. So you can see here, we already have two elites and one, two, three, four uh, regular units. So we have a total of six units. Now, any leaders or Nazguls are not considered a part of the actual army units. Instead, they're used to help with what's called a leader reroll because you'll roll your dice for combat and then you use the leadership that you have to then reroll any misses. So you can have as many leaders or companions or characters in any space with your, uh, your specific units here, but the total maximum amount of units you can have is 10 in any space. Let's move back to the free peoples, and I think they could pass and just see what our uh, the shadow player is going to do, but I think they're going to use this army die. Now, you can use an army die either to attack with any army unit that's on the board. doesn't need to have leaders like the character die would, or you can use this to move two individual armies, so long as the space that they're moving to is free for army movement. <laughs> and what that means is essentially they're not moving into a space that has enemy units, with the exception of if you're siege or an enemy stronghold that's under siege, then you can actually move an army unit into that space. You'll see that as we play. Right now, I'm going to go ahead and use this army die to move two armies. Currently, the Rahiram are not at war. That means all they can do is move within their own spaces, uh, their own lands, and you can see by the green, the green line denotes which lands are theirs, or they can move into free open land. 
those ones have no color around them. Uh, but what they can do is they can still move within their own lands. And what I'm going to do is, although this Fort of Aizen, we do have a fortification here, which is somewhat helpful. Uh, too many times have they been blown away <laughs> and useless. They're going to run, run to Helm's Deep. So we have here, we have two regular units, plus we have a, a leader. Remember that leaders don't give you additional dice in battle. Instead, they give you rerolls, and they will only be destroyed when all the other uh, units are destroyed, or there might be specific combat cards that can get rid of them. So I'm doing this simply to protect them and uh, shore up uh, Helm's Deep, since I can't muster any more units. I'm also thinking of doing the same thing over here by Minas Tirith. I'm going to go ahead and move these two army units one step back so they're all in Minas Tirith. That means they're at a stronghold and they're going to be much harder to kill. Kind of giving our shadow player, uh, you know what? Bring it. <laughs> See what you can do to me. I'm showing these up. Good luck. Because <laughs> here, look at this. We have one, two, three, four, five regular units. We have an elite unit and we have a leader. Moving back to the shadow player, let's go ahead and use this muster die. We're going to use this die to bring a character into play. Let's go ahead and bring Saruman out. We have here, if Isengard is at war, which it is, and Orthanc is unconquered, which it is, you may use one muster action die result to place Saruman in Orthanc, and he cannot leave Orthanc, because of course he's kind of a wuss. <laughs> uh, we have a couple special abilities here, the voice of Saruman, which is terrible. As long as Orthanc is under your control and not under siege, you may use a muster action die result to recruit one regular Isengard unit in uh, every Isengard settlement, Order a please replace two regular Isengard units in Orthanc with two elite units. Oh, that's terrible. On the upper right hand side of his card, you can see his level is zero. The level really only matters by the amount that they can move. So it's zero. That makes sense. He can't move. He has leadership of one. What that means is if ever he's in the same space as one of the uh, shadow uh, players that are attacking or being attacked, he can allow them to have one reroll during the leadership reroll phase. And then the unique thing for him, when he's out on the board, the shadow player gets plus one uh, action die. So remember how I said the free people, they only start with four and yeah, they're now going to be four to eight. They literally have double the amount of action dice. Now he can't use this one this round, but next round when they recover their dice, they will be able to reclaim or recover eight of them instead of seven. Now remember, he's not considered an army unit, so he doesn't have to worry about the stacking limit of 10. We still only have one, two, three, four, five, six, six total army units here. I almost forgot to mention the Servants of the White Hand ability. This one is terrible. Each Isengard elite unit is considered to be a leader as well as an army unit for all movement and combat purposes. <laughs> That's terrible. We'll move back to the free peoples. They're simply going to pass. They can because they have two dice to three. That's going to put us back to the shadow player. He's going to use this character die to do an army movement with a leader. As you can see over here in Mordor, we have tons of units, <laughs> lots of units. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to take this group and we have our leader, which is the Nazgul. We're going to have a move one space followed by the five uh, minions. These are regular units and we're going to move them one space over here to North Athelion. Now we can do that even though we do not have, Sauron's technically not at war, but these are free spaces. They're not controlled by anyone. So we can certainly move into them. We can even technically move into Osgiliath. We cannot, though you see this blue line, we cannot move into Minas Tirith or try and attack Minas Tirith until we're at war, which shouldn't take long except for the fact that I don't have any more mustard ice. So I'm going to have to wait till next turn. For our free people's turn, we're going to go ahead and use our Will of, of the West die, and we're going to use it as a muster die, and we're going to muster one of our free peoples. We can push them down on the political track. I'm thinking of doing that actually with the elves. I'm going to try and scare those shadow player into a little bit thinking that maybe we're going to fight with our elves, which we could. Uh, we don't have a ton of units, but they are powerful. Our shadow player only has two event dice. I think for one of them, he's going to use to draw a strategy card, Pits of Mordor, Play of Sauron is at war. <sighs> he's not at war. We can put this into our hand though. We have one Will of the West die and one Eye die left. I think for our Will of the West die, for our free peoples, we're going to play a power too great. This is going to stay on the table. It says advance the elven nation one step on the political track. We're going to be one step away from at war then. While this card is in play, the shadow player cannot move an army into or attack either in a field battle or in a siege, Lorien, Rivendell, or the Grey Havens. 
Now, the Shadow player can force a Power 2 Great to be discarded by using any one action die result and discarding one army event card and one character event card from their hand. Oof, that's a lot to get rid of that. Pushing the Elven Nation one space down means we're only one space away from at war. That's when we can start mustering units, we can start crossing borders, we can even try and take out some settlements. Oh, I haven't even shown you this, but we can try and take out settlements that could give us those four victory points. You might be wondering, how in the world does the Shadow Player get 10 victory points? Well, I should probably tell you. <laughs> you see this stronghold. It has two slashes, slashes on it. That means this is worth two victory points. So the Free Peoples can control Minas Morgul, which is, yeah, right. <laughs> but if they can, then that means they will control this and earn themselves two victory points. There's also cities on the board, like Pelagrir here. They are worth one victory point. So if the Shadow Player can get 10 victory points worth of these locations from the Free Peoples that they control, then they will win the game. The Free People only need four victory points, and Angmar is way up on top of the board, totally empty right now. It's kind of tempting. Our Shadow Player will end the round by using his final event die. Uh, once again, he doesn't have any events that he can really play, so he's going to draw one from the faction deck. This one is Servants of Sarva Sauron. Discard three cards from the faction event deck, add one card to your hand, then reshuffle the remaining two cards into your deck together with the faction event cards in your discard pile. Cool. That will complete phase five. Let's move into phase six. That's where we look to see, does anybody have enough victory points to win the game? So that is something to know. Let's say the free peoples got to four victory points, but then somehow during that same turn, the shadow player was able to push this down by one, maybe reclaim something. Then at the end of the round, the fellowship player has not won because you have to, you only check victory points at the end of the round. If ever there's 12 corruption though on the ring bearer, the game immediately ends in a loss for the free people. Likewise, if the free people can dunk the ring in the middle of the turn, they win the game. So with this, this will end the turn. Let's go ahead and recover our action dice and we'll start the next turn. We'll recover the two Free People's dice from here, but because we recovered one or more dice from the Hunt for the Ring spot, that means that the Shadow Player has to put at a minimum one die into the Hunt for the Ring, so we're just going to leave this here. For the Free People, they'll also get to continue to use uh, Narya's die because Gandalf is the guide of the Fellowship, and they at least used one die to move the Fellowship. So we'll have five dice for the free people, and we have seven dice here because Saruman added one for the shadow player. Let's now go ahead and draw our cards. So we have the death to the Forgoyle. We have here the musterings of the long planned war. Oh, that sounds great. And let's see, what do we have here? We have the Nazgul search. We'll also grab our three free people's cards, character, strategy, faction. They have the power of Tom Bombadil, yes, axe and bow, and we only need wings. We'll move to the fellowship phase. We definitely do not want to declare them. <laughs> and also we're not gonna change the guide because we like having that extra die for now. So we're gonna move right into the hunt allocation. So there's still a total of seven companions with the ring bear. So that means we can put up to seven dice here. Now, last time this one die didn't seem to be enough. I'm definitely gonna place two. It's the question of do I wanna push hard and do three? But if I do three, I'm limiting the actions that I can do with my army. And I really, I'm hoping for some better dice rolls. I got some nice uh, nice cards. So I'm going to go with just two, hoping that maybe we can uh, reveal at least a six with one of those rolls. We'll grab our five free people's dice, give them a roll. We have another Will of the West. You know, that's only on one of the six sides, but that's beautiful. We have another character event die, which is great, so we can move the fellowship. We have a muster or an army die and another muster die. Great for moving up the political track. I'm not sad about this roll. The shadow player will roll six dice, so they still have a little bit more. We have, ah, oh, we do have one eye. That's the only problem. If ever you roll an eye, it immediately goes to the hunt for the ring, which is good for finding the ring, but now look, we only have five dice. We only got one army die. We And look at this. None of these are muster dice. We are definitely getting unlucky. It's going to make it a little bit harder for us. Maybe we focus a little bit more on slowing down the fellowship. We each have a total of five dice, so the free peoples have to use a die, and so we're going to go ahead and use this event die to start off with. We're going to play the card Axe and Bow. Now, if we had used a character die, we could do this as well, but we use the event die since, well, <laughs> we can use event dice for any die, and character dice we can use to move or hide the fellowship. This says, play on the table if Gimli or Legolas are in the fellowship, which they certainly are. After the shadow player draws a hunt tile, you may discard this axe and bow to reduce the hunt damage by one to a minimum of zero. 
any remaining hunt damage must be confronted normally. Uh, and then you have to discard this if both Legolas and Gimli leave the Fellowship. You haven't seen a successful hunt yet, so that's not going to make a lot of sense. But don't worry, I will show you soon enough. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have one. So for our Shadow player now, I think we're going to use an army die. Now remember, we can use that either to attack with one army, can, can have a leader, doesn't have to have a leader, or we can move two army units. And I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move two different army units. I'm going to go ahead and start by moving these two over here in Nurn to come into here into Gorgoroth. Okay, so we have a total of five units here. We have a bunch of Southrons over here. I'm going to go ahead and move these ones all together so that we have a total of, what, two elites and one, two, three, four, five, six regular units. We're getting ready to take on Gundor. The question now becomes for the free peoples, do we want to take a chance? There are three eye symbols or three eye dice here. The shadow player would get to roll three dice. But if we don't move the fellowship, we won't get that extra die the next round. So I think I'm going to do it. I'm going to use this character die to try and move the fellowship. I should say we definitely are moving the fellowship. The question will be, can they find us? Our shadow player will roll three dice looking for a six and a two, two and a two. <laughs> They are terrible at finding Gandalf and the team. <laughs> Our shadow player is a bit stuck. We really need army dice and we need muster dice. We don't have any of those. <laughs> now, the nice thing is, is that the free peoples have those rings that they can use to change one of their dice one time around. And then after they do that, they actually give those rings to us as the shadow player, and we get to use them the same way. Once per round, we could switch one of our dice. So we have to get the free peoples to use one. <laughs> They're not using one. So, uh, and I definitely wouldn't if I saw this roll. So I think I'm going to use a character die to move one army with a leader. Uh, yeah, I think that's what I'm going to do. We're going to continue to combine our forces here in Mordor. We have five units here. We have five units here plus a Nazgul. So we're going to have this come and join here in Golgoroth. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of these uh, tokens here. This is going to denote that army, army of 10 units and a Nazgul, and we're going to place them on the side of the board. This will mean that I've emptied out Baradur. That three simply means that the army matches the three that's here, so we know which army we're talking about. So we'll put all of them here, and we could use that leader die, or that character die, remember, because I have a leader here, a Nazgul. We're going to move back to the free people, and I think what I'm going to do is use a muster die here to affect the political track. This is a little bit risky because it's going to allow the shadow player to get the black witch king out, uh, but we are going to push the elves to at war. So that means now we can recruit units for them and we can move them anywhere on the board. For our shadow player, let's go ahead and use another one of these to move another army. We're going to move that same army that we combined last turn from Gorgoroth over here to Minas Morgul. We, what I'm planning on doing is trying to get this out here, take these two armies, start to siege Minas Tirith. Then, if I can ever get uh, muster symbols so I can get the um, Easterlings at war, they'll come up this way and support them. Because whenever you're doing a siege, you're going to see you need a lot of elite units if you want to survive. So we want to get here, but we don't have a lot of elite units. So I need to get more of those out, but I can't do that until I get muster dice. Moving back to the free peoples, we're going to go ahead and use this muster die, and we're going to use that to bring out Lady Galadriel. If Sauron, no, or the elves, yes, are at war, and Lorien is unconquered, you may use a muster action die result to play Lady Galadriel. Heck yeah. Uh, we also have here uh, Nenya, the Ring of Adamant. Whenever a standard hunt tile showing an eye is drawn, use the Nenya Elven Ring counter to cancel its effect and draw another one instead. The canceled tiles remove from the play for the remainder of the game. And then you can see here it says Valor of the Elven People. You can recruit in Lorien even if it's under siege. <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> Normally if you're under siege you can't put in more units. They definitely can. Lady Galadriel also brings in her own action die, which is awesome. We can use it next turn. Now you can see there's this star symbol here. If ever we roll this die and choose this one, well, if it's the eye, we have to choose it. But let's say we decide to choose the character die here. After we use this die and Gandalf the White is in play, so if Gandalf the White is not in play, this does not happen. But if Gandalf the White is in play and we roll a die that has this symbol, the star symbol on it, that die is removed for the rest of the game. So they're great until you roll one of those things and they're not so great. And here we have Lady Galadriel. Let's go ahead and put her in Lorien. Lorien is over here right by Dol Guldur. 
you know, it makes me think, do I want to try and attack that since I can? <laughs> Probably not. I definitely don't think I'm ready for that. Looking at, let's see, I have an elite. I have two elites, one regular and one leader. They have four regulars, no, five regulars, elite and a Nazgul. Ugh. Moving back to our shadow player, let's go ahead and use our character die to move another army. It has to be an army with a leader, so we're going to move that same army we've moved the last two times over here to South Athelion. And can you just imagine what that would look like in Minas Tirith? <laughs> two spaces away, you see, what, 18 to 19 army units coming to get you with two Nazgul. Woohoo! Moving back to our free peoples, I think what I'm going to do is use this leadership die to recruit. Now remember, what we can recruit, either one elite unit, two leaders, but each leader has to be placed in a different free settlement that's controlled by you, uh, two regular units, they also have to be in different settlements, or one leader and one regular unit, once again in separate areas. So what I'm going to do is do uh, the, the recruit, and it has to be an elf, because it's the only one that I have at war, uh, but I'm going to do one elite unit, I'm going to put that into Lorien. I have an idea that might be a little bit risky, but we have the Mines of Moria right there, only two spaces away. If we could take that out, we give clear passage for the Fellowship and earn ourselves two victory points. And if you look here, our Shadow Player only has two regular units there. That's totally doable. But that would also mean we're leaving Lorien mostly unprotected. So if I get a couple more recruits there before going, I might feel a little bit better about myself. <laughs> Our final action for our Shadow Player is we're going to use our Event Die here to play Servants of Sauron. Draw three cards from the Faction Event Deck, add one card to your hand, then reshuffle the remaining two cards into your deck, as well as whatever in the discard pile, which will just be this card. Let's draw three cards. We have the Ships of a Great Drought, we have the Wild Hillmen, and we have a Great Fleet. Well, I'm looking at getting the, uh, the Hillmen in as soon as possible. So I'm going to take that one, I'm going to take these two, plus the one that I just played, shuffle that back into our faction deck. That'll end the action phase. Looking at our victory points, we're still both at zero. <laughs> so we'll just simply move on to the next round. We'll recover all of our action, uh, our action dice. Remember, one of these, we're going to have to leave in the hunt for the ring box because we had one blue die in the hunt for the ring. We will now, for the free peoples, have both of these dice that we get to roll. However, there's a catch with those. We're only going to be able to keep one of them when we roll it. So we still will only have a total of five action dice, uh, but we get to choose which one we want to keep. There is one catch. This one, specifically, I don't know if the other one has it. I'll have to look. Yes, it most certainly does. If either one of these rolls the eye symbol, we have to choose the eye symbol. So you're taking a chance using that ring. But so far, that ring has been super helpful. I've never felt this far ahead and ready to go on the free people's side. <laughs> Let's then go ahead and draw our cards. So we have a great fleet. We have the Isildur's Bane, and we have the Olagai. For our free people's player, we have Guards of the Citadel, There's Another Way, and Paths of the Dead. Now we have to determine how many dice we're going to allocate to the hunt. I think we're going to do two again. We're going to hope we don't roll a third one. I think two is good enough, uh, but I really need the rest of those dice for actions. We'll move to rolling our dice. We'll start with our free peoples. We'll give them a roll. Ah, see, that's the problem. This is going to have to go into the hunt pool. Now, you can see it's an eye symbol with the star, but right now Gandalf the White is not in play, so we'll still get our dice back. But that means we only have four dice this round. Why did I say they were doing so great? <laughs> but we do have muster dice. Wow, we actually have three muster dice and a leadership die. That's actually not great. Let's see if this is the time to shine for our shadow player. We have our six dice here. Let's give him a roll. Oh my gosh, here's another eye, another eye, and another eye. Wow, I don't think the fellowship's going to be moving this time. <laughs> we have only three dice. Uh, yeah, this, well, I've never had that happen either. <laughs> I should have mentioned during the fellowship phase, we could have changed our guide, but we didn't. Also, I just want you to see six eyes in the hunt for the ring. I think it's safe to say that the free peoples are not <laughs> going to be moving the fellowship this round. Instead, I think, looking at what we have here, I'm going to start off with using another muster action die. I'm going to use that to muster another unit. I'm going to grab another one of the elves elite units. We're going to place that here in Lorien, thank goodness. And looking at our total army here, we have one, two, three, four elites. We have one regular unit and we have a leader. 
Our shadow player is then going to use this mustard die. Now I'd love to use this mustard die to bring in one of our factions because we could. We could bring in those uh, those hillmen, but I think it's going to be better to use the voice of Saruman because of what we're planning on doing. So it states here that as long as we control that, we can use a mustard die to replace two regular units with two elite units. Then that's exactly what we're going to do in Orthanc. This means we have a total of four elite units and two regular units. That's great for sieging Helm's Deep. Moving back to our free peoples, I still can't believe we have more dice. <laughs> we're going to use this one. Instead of using the muster side, I think we're going to use the army side, and we're going to move two armies. Now what I'd love to do is to be able to move one army two spaces. I'd love to jump myself right over here into Moria. But I can't do that. Whenever you use an army die to move units or move armies, you can move two different armies, one space each. Now we know we have a stronghold here of Dal Guldur. I'm a little bit nervous, so I don't want to pull too many of my troops out. But I'm going to move over here to Differendel, or what is this, Dimradel Dale. I'm going to move one, two, three elites, this leader... Uh, into this space. I think that's pretty dang good. And we are one space away from Moria. We could siege Moria. How awesome is that? <laughs> As the free peoples, I'm also eyeing Agmar over here. Now the people of the north currently are not even close to being at war, but we can still move their units if they're in the same space. So I'm going to remove this one regular next to this one elite out of Bree into this area. We're only two spaces away from Agmar if we can find a way to rouse them up and try and attack it. We're not going to make Moria an easy pickings for the free peoples. What we're going to do is use this character die. We're going to play Nazgul Search. Now, we're not exactly using it for what we should be using it for, which I was holding on to, but that blasted fellowship is still hidden. <laughs> so, play if the fellowship is on the step one or higher on the fellowship track. It's on three. Move any or all of the Nazgul, so I can move them anywhere on the board. Then, if at least one Nazgul is in the region of the Fellowship, the Fellowship is revealed. Wouldn't that be an amazing way to reveal them? <laughs> but no, that's not happening, uh, because they are currently in a stronghold, uh, the Free People stronghold. The Nazgul cannot go there unless that location is under siege, which currently I don't have any under siege. So, but what I can do is I can at least get a Nazgul over into Moria to make it a little bit more of a challenge to take that out. We're going to grab both of these Nazguls, one here and one from here. We're going to place one here in Moria and one all the way over here in Mount Gundabad. <laughs> because we can kind of see the writing on the wall, what this free, the free peoples are going to do. And we're trying to protect those areas, but we can't even muster any more units until we actually go to war. So those Nazgul should scare a few people away. So now moving back to the Fellowship player, it's going to be the question of, do we do it? Do we push ourselves into Moria? <laughs> and the answer to that question is going to be yes. I mean, it's not often you get to do this. It is going to push Sauron into the at-war st uh, stage, which means he's going to be able to muster. Uh, a little bit nerve-wracking, but we're going to do it anyways. So we're going to use the army part of this, not the muster, and we're going to an attack an adjacent space. We don't actually move into that space. We're simply going to attack that space. The elves of Lorien are going to choose to attack Moria. The first thing that happens is the defending nation will become active. Well, Sauron is already active. Then they'll move up one space on the political track. We'll move up to at war. So now Sauron and Isengard is at war. I can't believe the elves were the first ones to throw the punch. So if this was a normal field battle, what would happen is we'd move into the battle phase. However, there is a stronghold here. So the defending player gets a choice. Do they want to fight a field battle first or do they want to go into a siege right away? And with two regular units in Moria, we're definitely going to go into a siege. What that means is that these units are going to retreat into the mines of Moria. So we're going to grab these units, take them off of the board, and place them over here into a shadow stronghold area. We then get to choose as the attacking player. Do we want to move into that space or do we want to stay where we are? And to me, it'd be silly to just stay where we are. <laughs> We're going to move into that space. Now, here's the thing. We do not control the Mines of Moria. The Mines of Moria are still controlled by the Shadow Player. So what I suggest doing is taking one of these Shadow Tokens and dropping in here to remind yourself, yep, that's definitely controlled by the Shadow Players. We're now sieging that area. That now ends the battle sequence. We'll have to use another die to actually siege Moria, to go in there, go into the mines, and feed out all those goblins and orcs. We'll move back to our shadow player, who is quite unhappy. <laughs> 
we're going to go ahead and use our army die here to play Olagai. Play if Sauron is at war. You better believe he's at war. Recruit one Sauron unit, regular or elite, definitely elite, in a region where a shadow army is present. Now, I'd love to do that in, in Moria. However, Moria is now besieged. That's the whole reason why I wanted to do that with the elves. I wanted to get there and besiege that so no additional units could come out. But we couldn't play this until Sauron was actually at war. Uh, so that's why, yeah, we were a little bit stuck. Uh, but yeah, we're definitely going to do this. We're actually going to place this over by Minas Tirith. We only have five units here, all regular. We're going to put an elite here as well. We'll move back to the free peoples, and I have an idea. I'm going to go ahead and use that as a character die. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have all four of these companions leave the fellowship. Because I'm doing this, I'm going to take their cards and put them out on the table. No longer will Gandalf be the guide. Instead, we'll have to look at who's remaining, which will be Aragorn. Aragorn is left, and he's at level 3. We have to have the highest level uh, character or companion to lead the fellowship. So even though there's uh, Merry and there is Gimli that's still there in the fellowship, because their levels are lower than Aragorn, Aragorn will have to be the guide. So he's up on top, and I'll show you that in a second. But we have Gandalf, Legolas, Boromir, and Peregrine Truk. What we can do is we can move them a total of three spaces equal to the level of the highest level companion because they're all moving together. So three plus the amount that we have movement on the fellowship track, six. We can move them up to six spaces. They can move through enemy units, no problem. The only catch is if they move into a shadow unit or a shadow stronghold, they have to immediately stop. Also, they can't move into a space where, let's say, that we were being besieged in Minas Tirith. We couldn't move into Minas Tirith unless we had a card that specifically let us. Uh, we're also going to remove all four of our tokens from there because we are no longer part of the Fellowship and all four of our miniatures. We're going to have all of our companions move one, two, three, and move themselves in to the Mines of Moria here. Now they could have moved a total of six, so we could have come down here to try and do something there. But what I want to do is have them help take on the Mines of Moria. Then I'm going to have some of them try and move down to Fanghorn, and we're going to try and give Saruman a hard time. Because we've got some Ents, we can put them on the board and start harassing him. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do with the free people. This does mean that Strider here is now our guide. So it says here you may use any of your action dice to hide the, the revealed fellowship. So he's really good at keeping the fellowship hidden, which is also super helpful. We also have a different idea for him. I want to get him down to Minas Tirith, if possible, or even adjacent to Eric, and we can bring in the uh, dead men of Dunharrow. Or we can go to Minas Tirith, uh, level him up to Aragorn instead of Strider, and get an additional action die. Lots of stuff to do. We still have no victory points for either player, so we'll start off with the next round. We're going to recover our dice. Remember, we're not going to get Narya anymore because we're no longer the fellow, the leaders of the Fellowship. However, we'll still get Nenya, so we'll roll this one for the Free Peoples. We also don't have to save any of the eye dice right now in the Hunt for the Ring box because the Fellowship did not move at all last round. This means right now it's 5 to 8 dice. And I still haven't brought a faction into play, you guys. Sorry about that. <laughs> I will get one in soon. Let's go ahead and draw cards. We have the Servants of Sauron. We have Give It To Us. <laughs> and we have the Fighting Urukai. Oh, yes, that's what we want. Um, and I will state that right now the Shadow Player has 6 cards in hand and 4 faction cards. So he needs to play them or he's going to start losing some. Actually, I have one extra faction card. I have five. I'm not thinking of bringing the spiders out. Well, heck, I still can't because the Fellowship, the token, hasn't left Rivendell yet. So I can't bring them out. So I'm going to place that in the discard pile. Our free peoples will also have six cards and four cards, respectively. Saruman is our neighbor, Kindred of Glorfindel, and we prove the Swifter. Moving to that Fellowship phase, we're not going to reveal the Fellowship, and, well, we're not going to change the guide. So then we're going to move into the Hunt allocation. We're going to put one die. We need action dice so bad. So we're going to only put one die here. Let's roll to see how many actions we get. We'll start with our free people. Remember, we still have Nenya, so we have five dice for this. We'll give them a roll. Oh, are you serious? We got the eye again. So we're going to make it harder to move, and we only get four action dice this round. We have two character, an event, and a muster die. That's actually pretty terrible. <laughs> This might be just what our shadow player needs. Let's see what we can get. 
Oh, we have two more eye symbols. Boy, well, we're not going to let the fellowship move, but we at least have some muster dice. We have an army die, an event die, and a character die. Let's move into that action phase. And you know what we're going to do? Starting with the free peoples, we're going to use this character die and we are going to assault. <laughs> I can't believe we're assaulting Mordor. And we have Gandalf and we have Boromir. This is going to be awesome. Just so you can see the makeup of the two armies. We have two regular units here and a Nazgul. Two elite units, one leader and four companions. Let's go ahead and resolve our first battle. <laughs> Who would have thought the first battle would be from the free people? I didn't. Okay, so when you do this, it's set in, into five phases. The first phase is we can play a combat card. Next, we'll roll dice for the combat roll, and then we'll roll dice for the leadership reroll. Then we'll remove casualties. Then we either choose to cease to attack or retreat uh, and go from there. Now, there's a couple special things since we're at a stronghold. We're at a stronghold right now, which means that the defending player has an advantage. That means the shadow player does. Right now, the shadow player will hit any of the units, the army units here on the elves side, on a 5 or a 6. The elf units will only get a success on a 6. This is because you're taking on a stronghold, which is a little bit harder to defeat. Also, after the first round of combat, combat will end unless we have the, uh, the attacking player downgrade one of their elite units to a regular unit. And you'll see how that works as we go. So our first step will be to play combat cards. You're each going to choose combat cards simultaneously, then reveal them face up, and then depending upon when they activate, there'll be a, an initiative number on there, as well it might tell you something happens before the roll or after the roll. It all depends upon the card. I've chosen my two combat cards. Let's go ahead and reveal them. For the free peoples, we have charge, and for the shadow player, we have desperate battle. So our charge, play if a free people's elite unit is in the battle. I have three elite units. Before the combat roll, roll an additional attack using only the free people's elite units, up to a maximum of five. In this game, you'll never roll more than five dice during combat. Even if you have more than five units, the max you can roll is five and then you can apply, apply the results immediately. That's amazing. If I can roll two sixes, I can take these two regular units out before anything happens. Here we have Desperate Battle. Uh, both armies add one uh, to their rolls for the combat roll and leader reroll. Basically, we know as the shadow player we're not going to win. <laughs> what we want to do is take out as many units as possible. Because remember, units for the free people are removed from the game. They can't get them back. So if we can take them out more, we can recruit more and hopefully get uh, Moria back. Or just leave it alone and try and take out some of their settlements. Because now, Lorien is really vulnerable. So that means that maybe we want to actually start moving there. So really, we just want to take out as many units units as possible. Now you can see here this initiative number. This one would happen before this one because this is two. Two happens before three. So we're going to do the charge first. We get to roll because we have three total elite units. We're going to roll three dice. Any sixes will help us eliminate those uh, regular units that are hold, held up in Moria. Let's go ahead and roll our three dice for the charge. Remember, we need a six for any of these to hit. And we get one six. That means we've removed one orc beautiful. And that's before even the combat roll. So now let's determine our dice for the combat roll. We have three elites for the free peoples. So we're going to have three dice, but we have Legolas and Boromir with us. Boromir states, if Boromir is in a battle, add one to the combat strength of the free people's army. You can still roll only a maximum of five. Legolas, as the captain of the West, also does the same thing. So that means I actually get to roll five dice for them instead of only three. <laughs> That's why I did that. We now will only get one die for the shadow player. Now this die will hit on a four, five, or six. Any of these dice will just hit on a five or six. And that's because of that desperate battle card that the shadow player played. So let's give them a roll. Okay, we have a hit here and we have a hit here and a hit here. <laughs> None of these are hits. Now what we get to do is we move to the leadership reroll. So we have one Nazgul. That means we have a leadership value of one for our shadow player. They could reroll that die, but it's already a hit. So why would they do that? Also for our free peoples, we have one leadership un or leader unit. So that gives us one reroll. Plus we have all of our companions. Our companions also have leadership values. So like Gandalf the Grey has one for leadership. So we'd add one. Boromir has one and Legolas has one. So, and actually Peregrine has one. So we could reroll up to four of these, but we already have the hits that we need. So no need to do that. So what we need to do is now resolve the damage that we have here. And each player gets to choose 
who they're going to eliminate or lose from their army. For our shadow player, it's pretty simple. We're going to lose this one unit, and whenever you lose an entire army and you have a leader involved, that leader is also removed. So we've just lost one Nazgul. <laughs> It's actually pretty amazing. Uh, for our free peoples here, we're going to remove this one uh, this one elite, and it's gone forever. It's going to be placed in the casualty pile, and we're going to instead replace that with one of our regular units. We'll then place all of our units back into Moria, flip this over, and we are halfway already to winning the game. <laughs> This also means with controlling Moria, we now have a safe path for the Fellowship to walk through as well. That's pretty awesome. We'll gain ourselves two beautiful victory points. Well, that certainly does not make the Shadow Player very happy. <laughs> but I think what we're going to start off with for our Shadow Player is using a Muster Die. We're going to use our Voice of Saruman again and replace two of our regular units here. And we now have every single elite unit that we can possibly have for the Isengards here. I think they are poised to strike Rohan. With that though, I think our Elven player is going to play the Kindred of Glorfindel. We're going to use, let's use our event die. I want to keep this one just in case. We're going to recruit one Elven unit. We're going to recru uh, recruit an elite one in Rivendell. Then we get to draw one additional strategy card. So I'm going to grab a strategy card and we're going to grab the Spirit of Mordor. If the shadow player keeps putting all those eye dice into the hunt box, we might as well build up our army. And look at this Agmar sitting there for one victory point. And Mount Gundabad is right here for another two. Oh, it's looking fun. Our next move will be our shadow player. We're going to use this army die to move two armies. And I think it's time for the white hand to move. We're going to move all of these units. One, two, three, four, five. I'm trying to decide. I think I might leave this one. I know about the Ents, and I know what they do, and they're going to try and take out Saruman. Is one unit going to save him? No, it's not. You know what? We're just going to push, because that's going to mean that the, the uh, Free Peoples have to spend time trying to take out Saruman, and in the meantime, we can wipe out Rohan. However, we have now just moved into Rohan's uh, land. That makes them go active. Although it makes them go active, they don't move up on the political track, but now they actually can move all the way down to the at-war step. As the Free Peoples player, I think I'm just going to pass. I have one less die, I can do that. So then the Shadow player is going to use this to go ahead and attack Helm's Deep. By declaring that attack, that means Rohan will be pushed one farther down on the political track, yet they still cannot muster, and they still can't even move outside of their own region <laughs> or free spaces. The Rahiram are definitely going to jump into Helm's Deep. <laughs> They're not going to sit out there and have a, a regular fight against, look at all those elites. So we're going to put these, so we've got what, three regular units and one leader into Helm's Deep. That also means all of these units are going to move on to Helm's Deep with this. I'm actually just going to remove this for right now to make it easier for you guys to see. Uh, so we'll put them all into this space. However, remember, Helm's Deep is still controlled by the Free Peoples. And you can see here there's a nice spot that you can place your characters into Helm's Deep so you know uh, which characters you have there. Moving back to our Free Peoples player, we're going to have to use one of these two dice. Let's go ahead and use our Muster Die, and we're going to pull out... This is our last Elite for the Elves. We literally, in our reinforcements, have one regular unit left. That's it. <laughs> so you can see we have limited resources as the Free People. We are just getting good dice results and taking advantage of it. So we're going to go ahead and place out this Elite in Rivendell. We are definitely placing some pressure onto that Shadow Player, because look at this. Angmar is there, one, two, three steps away. With that though, our shadow player was ready for it. He's going to play the Pits of Mordor using the event die here. It states, play if Sauron is at war. He's definitely at war. Recruit two regular Sauron units in each of the three, in each of three different Sauron strongholds. We're going to place two here in Minas Morgul, two more over here in Dol Guldur. Oh boy. And Mount Gundabad will get two more as well. It's going to make it a challenge, well, at least a little bit more of a challenge to take out. Moving back to the Free Peoples, I think we're going to use this die to move another uh, army faction that has a leader. If nothing else, we're going to bluff this. <laughs> we're going to move out of Rivendell. <laughs> the elves, they're doing it all. Now, I'm leaving Rivendell totally empty. That's a terrible idea. We're going to leave one elite back here just in case. 
Oh, do I, yeah, yeah, we're going to do that, though, uh, because what I can do is I also have the Wooded Realm. You can't see it on screen, but they're only a couple spaces away, too, and they can help me uh, try and take on Mount Gundabad. However, the Shadow Player has something else in mind. How about the Witch King? <laughs> we're going to play the Witch King, the Black Captain. If Sauron and at least one free people's nations are at war, well, thank you, elves, you may use one muster action die result to place the Witch King in any region with a shadow army that includes at least one Sauron unit. And then, it states here, will activate all free people's nations. So I'll flip all nations to the active side. Also, he has a sorcerer ability. If the Witch King is in battle and you use a combat card during the first round of battle, after doing so, you may immediately draw an event card from the deck matching the type of that card. So if I play a card that's a character card or a strategy card, I get to draw another one. Yeah, and you can see here his level is unlimited because he can go anywhere he wants. His leadership is two, and you know what the other thing is? They're going to get their ninth die. Oof. They're just going to keep pushing up their action advantage. Of course, if they roll three I results, that doesn't happen, but <laughs> that's what their plan is. I think it's safe to say that the Witch King would like to come right here because what our goal is next time, as long as we get enough uh, uh, dice that we can use, we're going to try and take on Minas Tirith. We'll end the round, and sadly, the Free Peoples, they need two more victory points. It feels so close yet so far. <laughs> so let's go ahead and start that next round. We're going to recover all of our dice. Once again, the Fellowship did not move because of all of those eye symbols. So we'll go ahead and recover all five dice because Galadriel's still there. And we have nine dice for the Free Peoples. Wow, nine dice. Not Free Peoples, the Shadow Player. Let's go ahead and draw our event cards. We have Servants of Sauron. We have the Nazgul Strike. Oh, that sounds really awesome. And we have the Shadow is Moving. We have one too many faction cards, so I'm going to go ahead and discard the Great Fleet. I haven't even gotten them. I have to move them two more spaces down the political track before the Easterlings are at war. And then I can bring in the Corsairs. I just have not had enough mustard dice. I cannot believe how much I've had that. And that's restricted the, the, the Shadow player a lot. The Free People's player will go ahead and draw three cards. They have Elven Cloaks, Faramir's Rangers, and the Ents Awaken. We're going to have to discard two cards, one faction and one character card. Now, something I haven't talked about. The faction cards, if ever that deck runs out, you just draw a new one. Character and strategy cards, if ever you have them exhausted, you just don't get to draw any more. So that's something to note. I will never get to play the You Know the Way There. We've drawn our cards and recovered our dice. We're going to move to the Fellowship phase. Nothing's going to happen there. No revealing. We've stayed at three the last two rounds just because of how the dice have rolled. So moving to the Hunt allocation, we're just going to place one die here. We know that Fellowship, although it's important, we can see that the, the Free Peoples are really looking to get those four victory points for military victory. We need as many dice as we can to counteract that. We need to put some pressure on them. We have not done that enough. So that's what we're going to do here. We'll start with the Free People's Dice. Let's give them a roll. That looks quite good, actually. I like it. The Muster I probably didn't need, but everything else looks pretty dang good. The Shadow Player, eight dice. I better not roll a ton of eyes this time. I need Musters. I need, oh my gosh, two more eyes, you guys. But look at this. We have Army Muster Sides. I don't think we've seen any of those yet, and we've got three of them. That means we can choose either one that we want. That is beautiful.